Um, I'm excited to be here today to talk to you all about some of the work I did as part of my dissertation research. So currently a postdoc at the EPA, but this is primarily work that I did with Brad Murray, my PhD advisor at Duke, as well as um, the CSDMS integration facility. And specifically, I worked really closely with Eric Hutton. So definitely want to acknowledge Brad and Eric and all this work. So I don't think this crowd needs a ton of motivation here, but um, deltas are really important landscapes. They've long been ideal for human settlement and they are flat and fertile. So people have lived on them for a long time. So currently they're really densely populated or tend to be densely populated landscapes. They're also really important for things like um, um, transportation and trade. They have um, very important waterways and they host all kinds of natural um, resources that have been important for us. Um, but despite the importance of these landscapes, we don't fully understand the drivers of delta morphologies. Um, and this is especially the case when we think about how humans have been impacting morphology over the past um, the recent history as well as, as farther in the past. And so unfortunately, again, despite the importance of these landscapes, they're increasingly vulnerable. And this is in part due to things like eustatic sea level rise as well as increasing rates of subsidence. And a lot of these, these factors are things that we have done as in terms of anthropogenic modifications of the landscape. And so river channel avulsions are a natural process that happens on deltas. And by channel avulsions, I simply mean that the river is changing course relatively rapidly. And um, these low landscapes, the delta, deltaic landscapes, are built through um, the, the stacking of these different lobes. And the way that these lobes form along the shoreline are through these repeated channel avulsions that redistribute where the sediment is going to be deposited along the shoreline. And so for the case of the Mississippi, you can see that um, over the past few thousand years, there have been a number of different um, channel avulsions that have caused these different lobes to stack upon one, of one another. And um, these avulsions, although they are a natural process, um, are currently not great for us as humans. So we have built up a lot of infrastructure around rivers, um, for example, New Orleans. And so if the channel were to relocate now, not only would that impact us economically, but it also could cause all kinds of problems in terms of flooding and, and damaging infrastructure and threatening human lives. So we, um, in the case of the Mississippi, about almost a century ago now, have been regulating the flow of the Mississippi down its current um, path versus letting it evulse to go down the Atchafalaya River. And so an interesting thing to note here is that the, the modern um, delta, the modern bird's foot lobe, actually sticks out quite a bit farther than the rest of the lobes in part or due to this fact that we're regulating where the channel um, is going to go or where the channel is going. So um, these are really natural processes that happen on deltas, but again, we don't fully understand all the drivers of when, where, and why these channel evolutions are going to occur, even though they've been focus of a lot of research as of late. And so I think everybody in this room has probably seen some iteration of this ternary diagram, but just to hit, hit home that rivers or deltas are in, influenced by a whole mix of um, things, including rivers, waves, and tides, which is again represented by this um, ternary diagram here, the relative influence of those things. And there's also things like grain size and sediment cohesion that are going to impact delta morphology. And um, this is Increasingly important to understand these relative influences because we as humans, as I mentioned before, have done a lot to shape these landscapes as well. And so in my research, I've been particularly interested in understanding the impact of um, rivers and waves and how these, two, um, how these two factors are interacting to shape delta morphology and also what do these interactions do in terms of affecting evolution behavior. And that's a particularly important question over large space and time scales. So as we think back to the Mississippi, we're talking about thousands of years of evolution and, and really large spatial scales. So there are a couple key questions that I sought to address in my work. And again, just trying to figure out what are the, the feedbacks between the fluvial and, and coastal processes that drive morphology and evolution behavior, as well as how are these morphodynamics affected over large space and time scales. So again, because these things are happening over a long period of time, we would expect things like sea level rise um, to change, or sea level to change. And so not only are we, do we need to understand how these things interact, but we need to know how they're going to interact in the future with changing forces. And so um, no previous delta model seemed fit to address the sort of questions that I wanted to ask over these large space and time scales. So I ended up developing a new delta evolution model using the CSDMS um, tools. And so this model was designed um, to 
look at, again, these large space and time scales, and it's also been sort of generally designed not with any particular delta in mind, but it can, it can represent um, deltas with a range of fluvial and coastal processes. And I'm also going to be representing everything non-dimensionally, so this model is scale invariant. And we decided to base the model on couplings using the basic model interface, um, which I'm sure everybody's heard a lot about this week. Um, and so as a first step, I developed this river avulsion and floodplain evolution model, or what I'll be calling RAFM, and I coupled it to a pre-existing coastline evolution model, or what I'll be calling CDM. And the nice way, uh, the nice thing about doing things through this coupling is that it allows for a lot of additional couplings. So, for example, a marsh module or more complex subsidence module in the future. So I'm going to briefly describe the two models and then and get into the results. So in RAFM, the um, river cell widths are wider than the channel widths, such that, such that we're not resolving sub um, cell scale fluvial processes. But an important thing to note is that the river um, levees, the, the floodplain deposits that form from overbank sedimentation right adjacent to the river, those are contained within a river cell. Um, as you can see in this cross section here, so the, the levees. And so the floodplain cells that I'm talking about, when I talk about the floodplain generally, I'm not talking about the levees, but sort of the more distal floodplain away from the levees. And so the river course is determined using a pretty simple steepest descent algorithm where the, the, um, this algorithm is going to iterate along the gr elevation grid until it reaches sea level. And the elevation changes along the river profile are calculated using a linear diffusion equation. And in all of the results that I'm going to show you here, subsidence is uniform across the domain. And any new land that's created behind the shoreline, so as the shoreline prograde's, there will be um, marsh is created behind that um, shoreline, and that marsh is maintain, maintains some small elevation above sea level due to organic sedimentation processes. And we also impose a quasi-equilibrium generalized prune rule um, erosion of the shoreline as sea level transgresses on shore. And so as either base level rises or the river prograde's because of that linear diffusion equation, the river bed will also degrade. And so at a certain point, the riverbed will become relatively perched um, versus the distal floodplain location. And so I used what is just a normalized super elevation ratio where the channel elevation, channel bed, ele channel bed super elevation is normalized by the channel depth um, to calculate when an avulsion would occur. So I set that as a critical parameter to determine at this point that an avulsion could potentially occur. So for a super elevation ratio of less than one, it means that the riverbed elevation is lower than the, the floodplain elevation versus greater than one means the riverbed elevation is, um, high, is higher than the um, floodplain elevation, I think I said. So for at less than one, it's below the floodplain elevation, greater than one, higher. And so once this critical super elevation reach, ratio is reached in a given river cell, the new steepest descent path to sea level is calculated. And if that path is shorter and therefore going to be steeper than the prior course, the avulsion is successful, so the, the river actually changes course. Whereas if the river um, path, the new river path to sea level is not shorter and therefore it's not steeper, in that case the avulsion is not successful and instead a crevasse flay is deposited adjacent to the river there. And so the fluvial sediment flux from RAFM is then redistributed along the shoreline via CEM or the coastline evolution model. And CEM conserves near source sediment and it um, it assumes an approximately constant um, shore phase geometry and um, long-term shore phase geometry, and it uses gradients and along shore sediment transport to calculate erosion and accretion of the shoreline down to the shore phase depth. And in CEM, the offshore wave approach angle changes daily. We call this mix of influence from different um, wave angles the wave climate, which is represented by two different parameters. Um, a being the um, asymmetry parameter, so it's the fraction of wave influence from waves approaching from the left, and U is the um, as a diffusivity coefficient. So it's essentially it is how what fraction of wave influence is coming from high offshore wave angles versus low offshore wave angles. So this is important in that high a U greater than 0.5 or a high angle wave climate, as I'll be calling it. That sort of that wave climate tends to grow shoreline perturbations. Um, it's anti-diffusive versus um, a greater influence of low angle waves or AU less than 0.5 will tend to smooth out shoreline, shoreline perturbations and be um, diffusing these shoreline shapes. And so um, I've used a 
again, I already used the BMI to couple these things, but I also used the CSDMS cluster at the time, Beach, which is I'm sad to say is no longer with us, but um, I used Beach to perform a bunch of parameter studies to look at how things like changing use, sea level rise rate, and wave height affected both the, the delta morphologies and the evolution dynamics. And before jumping into those results, I want to show you just a few videos just to give you a sense of how the model evolves over time. So in these videos, there's no sea level rise, but um, so we're just gonna be looking at the channel prograding. And here it's pretty explanatory. The green is the land, blue is the ocean, the blue line is, represents the river cells. And for this case, the wave height is relatively low and the, the um, U value is 0.3, so it's a diffusive wave climate. I and mean, in all the work that I'm gonna show you, A is 0.5, so that means we have a symmetric wave climate and a symmetric um, influence. You have waves coming from the left and the right. So I'll set this off. And so again, relatively low wave influence. So the river is prograding relatively quickly. I should also mention that the backwater lengths here are just a characteristic length, which is the channel depth divided by the slope. And time is non-dimensionalized by a channel filling time scale. So river prograds quickly. Waves aren't doing a lot to smooth the shoreline. If we bump up the influence of um, waves, again, with the same A and U values, except for um, a higher wave height, then progradation is inhibited. The river's not prograding as quickly because more of that sand is being spread along the shoreline. And so evulsions don't happen quite as quickly. And something that's interesting to see, too, is that the old delta lobes tend to diffuse away, whereas before, the lobes persist, or the, the shoreline shapes weren't diffusing as quickly. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you a profile view that follows the river course. So here, the river cells, this is 10 river cells, is equivalent to one backwater length to relate back to before. And the blue line is following the riverbed elevation, the green lines are the adjacent floodplain cell elevations. And in this case, the critical super elevation to trigger an avulsion is one, which you'll see pretty clearly. So again, this is with no sea level rise or no base level rise, which can also drive in channel aggradation. You'll notice as the channel is prograding, the riverbed is aggrading and the um, blue line is getting closer to the green lines, which means that the super elevation ratio is getting closer to one. So once that ratio is met and a new steepest descent course to sea level is determined, then the avulsion occurs and Another interesting thing to um, note is that as the channel shortens and steepens, that wave of channel degradation migrates upstream. And so now I'll jump into what the, the parameter study results look like. And so in all of this, I'm holding the background wave characteristics, or the, I'm sorry, the background river characteristics constant. So it's just changes in the wave climate that are dictating changes in the fluvial mor or the delta morphology here. So um, these plots here are a range of different morphologies where we have increasing wave height along this axis from the left to the right and increasing influence of high angle waves from the top to the bottom. And um, I, we can represent the relative influence of the, the waves and the river using this fluvial dominance ratio or R, which is essentially just a ratio of the um, fluvial sand flux QR and this QX max value, which is the maximum possible longshore transport from waves, longshore transport from, from the river mouth to the left and the right of the river mouth. So it's essentially a measure of um, both the wave height and the U value or influenced by both wave height and U. And so this R is essentially a ratio of how quickly is sand spread along the shoreline away from the river mouth, where R greater than one would tend to represent what we think of as a river-dominated um, delta, and R less than one we would tend to think of as a wave-dominated delta. And so if we start over here on the left-hand side of this set of plots, at relatively low wave height, the sign of, or the, the value of U, or the sign of the wave climate diff diffusivity, doesn't have a big impact on the delta morphologies. And this kind of makes sense. If the waves are small, they're not gonna have a big impact on what the delta looks like, so that U doesn't really matter. But if we move farther to the right, the sign of the where wave heights are increasing, so that um, Q, the R value is decreasing, 
um, the, the sign of the wave climate diffusivity does matter, that U value does matter. So looking up at the top where we have a relatively diffusive wave climate, that U value is less than five, the shorelines are relatively flat, they have a diminishing aspect ratio because the wave climate is working to smooth out all those shoreline perturbations versus going down to the bottom, um, the shoreline is locally smooth, but shoreline perturbations are not, are, are allowed to grow because of that anti-diffusive wave climate. And another interesting thing to note is that for a diffusive wave climate, the old delta lobes are tending to diffuse away relatively quickly versus, especially down in this um, bottom right-hand plot, the um, old delta lobes actually persist as these like cuspate-like features after the river revulses away from them. And so the relative um, or the directional spread of offshore wave influence also impacts the avulsion time scales. And by that, I just mean how quickly does it take for an, an avulsion to occur? And so in these plots, I'm showing on the y-axis that time to avulsion or how long it takes the avulsion to occur. On the, um, that's on the y-axis and on the x-axis, it's increasing sea level rise rate. And I've plotted four different U values. So the top ones are diffusive and these bottom ones are more anti-diffusive and a range of wave heights. So the blue and the green are relatively low wave heights, whereas the, um, the warmer colors are the higher wave heights. And so first looking at where we have a greater influence of, of, from the waves, so the bigger waves, so the warmer colors, um, where U values are smaller or more diffusive, Avulsions will tend to take longer, and you saw this in the video, avulsions will tend to take longer because that shoreline progradation is inhibited. Um, sand is being spread farther away from the river mouth. Whereas with a larger U value, these of the avulsions are able to occur more quickly because progradation isn't as inhibited. And then interestingly, looking at sort of the smaller wave side of things, the wave climate diffusivity isn't as important, again, because the relative influence of the waves relative versus the, the fluvial impact, so the fluvial forcings, it's relatively small. So progradation is going to occur the avulsion, regardless of what the wave climate um, diffusivity is and avulsions are not are going to um, occur at about the same rate. And we can also look at how sea level rise impacts the avulsion timing. So um, it's more intuitive to think about the diffusively wave dominated deltas. So typically we think about um, wave dominance as tending to slow down the rate of um, progradation again. And so therefore, um, or we think about base level rise as driving avulsions happen, happening more quickly. And this is the case for the diffusively wave dominated deltas. And we look up here, so looking to the right on the plot, the time scale of avulsions for these, of these warmer colors decreases. But we didn't find that that was the case for the river dominated deltas or for these um, wave-dominated deltas with a bigger U-value or a more anti-diffusive wave climate. And that's pretty counterintuitive and in contrast to what people have tended to talk about. And so we thought about <laughs> developing some analytical time scales for base level rise-driven progradation and avulsions and progradation-driven um, and progradation-driven avulsions. And if we can comp compare them, it makes a little bit more sense. So this TB is a, um, minimum time scale for base level driven avulsions. Um, and I don't have time to go into the details of these, but the TP is, this, is a minimum time scale for progradation driven avulsions. And so if we compare the two um, time scales, we can think about when that sea level rise rate will, play, will, will have an impact on avulsion timing. And we can do a little rearranging to look at when that time scale for progradation driven avulsions is much faster than base level rise driven avulsions. And so if that's the case, that those progradation driven avulsions are happening much faster than base level rise can influence um, the, the channel filling processes, then sea level rise just isn't gonna have much of an impact on the avulsion timing. So we can do a little rearranging with these time scales and come up with this relationship where we can look at what the sea level rise rate and, and some characteristic geometry from the delta lobe and understand when this um, progradation, um, when the time scale for base level rise will be relatively high versus the progradation. So just to give you a sense, the, um, for the Mississippi actually, we would expect that the, times, the base level rise driven aggradation is not as 
not as important as the progradation driven aggradation. So this just means that base level rise may not, or sea level rise may not have as much of an impact on how quickly avulsions occur and the absence of thinking about all of this stuff. And then another thing to, to quickly note is that the avulsion timescales, and this is intuitive, the avulsion timescales are gonna depend on how um, on that super elevation ratio that's required to trigger an avulsion. So how much in-channel aggradation is required to trigger um, the avulsions. If the super elevation ratio is small, avulsions will tend to occur more quickly because you just don't need as much in-channel aggradation. And so I also thought about looking at the avulsion length scale, which is also a really important um, characteristic of these processes. And most avulsions in nature in the lab have tended to scale with the backwater length, which I briefly defined before, but to bring up again is um, geometrically just the, the defined as the channel depth divided by the channel slope. So it's a characteristic length scale. And again, all these avuls avulsions have tended to fall scale somewhere with this backwater um, distance. And it's a geometric distance, but it's also the, the part of the river that tends to feel the effect of base levels, the, the, where the, the hydrodynamically. So um, it's impacted by things like, by where the actual um, like sea level is hydrodynamically as well. And so because of that, there's been a lot of work um, that's come out recently focused on understanding how this back, how backwater effects hydrodynamically can create a preferential length scale for avulsions. And um, and this this view of avulsions, these there's a preferential link scale for avulsions that tends to occur because of the um, alternation between high and low flow conditions, and that essentially I'm oversimplifying it, but it it causes a, a location within the backwater length or that scales with the backwater length where sediment is to pre preferentially deposited, and so avulsions tend to occur at that location. But I don't include any of those, those backwater hydro, hydrodynamics in the RAFM CEM model, and we still find a preferential avulsion length scale that scales with the backwater length. So these are just three snapshots of those profiles um, from before that you saw. So um, you'll remember that in the coupled model, the riverbed approaches the um, sup approaches super elevation most quickly, or the critical super elevation ratio most quickly, where uh, the break and slope in the floodplain is. And so the river becomes super elevated most quickly at that break and slope. And this is um, interesting because instead of being driven by backwater hydrodynamics, this is more of a geometrically driven uh, avulsion explanation. And I looked at a range of different, um, or two different critical super elevation ratios, one and 0.5, which are bounding of what we would find or, or what these values typically are for avulsions. Um, for observations of avulsions in the field, and found that, again, these are a set of different model experiments for each of the colored envelopes where the line represents the mean of the set of experiments, and found that this um, avulsion length is not as sensitive or is not sensitive to the sea level rise rate or to the wave climate characteristics, but it fundamentally is a geometric, um, is geometrically controlled in the model. So this is in contrast to those backwater driven avulsions where here we find that the avulsion length is geometrically and morphodynamically driven. And so a recent paper, and before the paper came out, I had been thinking to myself, like we know that geometry in that model, the results that I've shown you as an in-member, is this even realistic? And a paper just came out that called into question the validity of the, that model geometry. So I went about looking at rivers across the world and I used just a very simple way to look at floodplain elevations where I, I took the river center lines and I created a 15 kilometer buffer for these two rivers, um, for example, and, and looked at what those floodplain elevations profiles would look like, which is represented here, the, the distal, I'll call them distal floodplain elevations. And then I mapped the most recent major avulsion sites on the profiles, which are represented by the dash lines. And, then I can compare what the slopes of the floodplains are upstream and downstream of the river, of the avulsion node, I'm sorry. And so for the Mississippi River, the upstream, the average upstream slope is about six times higher than the slope downstream of the avulsion node. Whereas for the Brahmaputra, it's not quite as dramatic, but it's about two and a half times higher, the average background slope relative to the slope downstream of the avulsion node. So while the, the model geometry is potentially an in-member, it looks like 
potentially in these settings, the floodplain profiles might be diffusing more slowly than the river profiles like in Rapham. And also interestingly, there's been, er, there's really good agreement between the amount of in-channel aggradation required to trigger an avulsion and that avulsion length. So at the avulsion length scale. So in, in my work, it's um, the, for a super elevation ratio of 0.5, it's avulsions tend to occur with, or the avulsion length scale tends to be about one backwater length and um, closer to two for a super elevation ratio of one. Um, so that's without any backwater hydrodynamics. Um, this recent modeling paper, um, the, the variable discharge case, so that's including the backwater hydrodynamics, um, has a scaling that's very similar. Whereas for the constant discharge case, the scaling is, def is way different than the results that we find from this model, from my modeling work. And then also looking at some lab experiments, the scaling is pretty similar. So that begs the question, what are the differences in the models that are giving such similar scalings, but for very different reasons? Um, so in RAF, I'm, you'll remember that the, as the channel um, progrades and evolves, and then um, the course shortens and steepens, there's a decent amount of upstream channel degradation that will occur as a, as a result of the channel sh shortening. Um, and so the super elevation, the super elevation upstream of the avulsion node is then decreased because the channel is incised after an avulsion occurs. And if we think about it a little more simply too, the, the, where these avulsions can occur, where super elevation um, is, the critical super elevation is reached most quickly, is limited by where sea level is. And that is because um, this, LB is the backwater length is a characteristic or geometric characteristic geometry such that and for um, in our model because the river mouth is tied to a channel depth below sea level this the riverbed will tend to intersect sea level at the backwater length so what that means is that there the where, where avulsions are going to occur in our model is tied to sea level this is because aggradation is going to migrate upstream and that limits how far upstream an avulsion can occur because super elevation is migrating upstream. But the avulsions must also occur sufficiently far upstream such that the super elevation can develop in the first place. So that occurs as the riverbed approaches sea level. So regardless of the initial model geometry, avulsions are going to attend to occur, occur at a place that scales with the backwater length in our model. And this is different than the modeling work that recently came out last month in GRL, where um, the delta reoccupies one of four different channels. The, um, essentially, after an avulsion occurs, it's, the river um, is going to prograde from that avulsion node, and the information um, from the discontinuity and channel slope is not going to be transmitted upstream. So the upstream channel degradation does not occur in the same way like it, do, it does not occur like it does in our model. And so because that super elevation is maintained over the repeated, over repeated avulsions, the, um, the avulsion length um, grows higher in the constant discharge scenario. Whereas with the um, variable discharge scenario, the avulsion length tends to be tied closer to the river mouth um, in their modeling work. So this begs the question, which of these two explanations is most relevant? Um, so thinking about lab experiments, the um, we would expect in these experiments that the channels are not always really well defined. There's sheet flow outside of the channel, so the floodplain elevation can keep um, aggrading at the a relatively same pace as the river, um, the channel bed. And so the hydrodynamic explanation may be more relevant or is potentially more relevant in these scenarios. But if we think about natural deltas or natural channels, um, there's a range of floodplain connectivities. So um, especially when we think about anthropogenic modifications, this degree of floodplain connectivity is very, very different. And so um, I'm going to leave that up there as an open question. I don't think we, we, don't, we haven't sorted this out yet. Um, but it's important to understand how quickly the floodplain is aggrading relative to the channel bed. And so all of this has really important implications. The avulsion timing and length scales um, has important implications for things like a restoration projects. So um, for, for example, planning sediment diversions, all of this information is super relevant. And, it also has important implications for things like interpreting fluvial stratigraphy because when and where avulsions are occur is going to impact the fluvial flux, how much sand is being delivered or what type of sediment are being delivered at the river mouth. So that impacts what kind of deposits we would find. But really quickly, I just want to put a plug in for you all. Um, we would love to have more couplings to this. 
um, model because it will expand the type of questions that can be asked. Um, and it can be done because it's been set up using the CSDMS infrastructure. It can be done really easily using the BMI and um, RAFM is soon or imminently going to be a part of PyMT. And so just to throw out some ideas, um, but there's all kinds of important things that could be included um, in the model to expand the scope of the questions that can be addressed. And so with that, I just wanna thank you and say that you can download the code um, from this site. It's also part of the CSDMS repository. And if you're interested in developing more couplings, um, I'd love to talk to you and help you as much as I can. Thanks. Great, thanks, Catherine. I think actually the IMT already includes RAFM, if I'm not mistaken. It's okay. it's real close. Or it's real close. Okay. <laughs> uh, questions for Catherine. We have time for a couple questions. I have one. I'm just curious. This is a little bit of a side note, but do we have a sense of what it is that sets the critical super elevation ratio? It varies like orders of magnitude even. So for the Mississippi, there's data that show like it can be on the order of 0.1 and for other scenario or other situations, it can be up to three. And so it's a function of all kinds of things like vegetation or the, the levee strength and it's not totally clear. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of work has gone into that and it's not fully flushed out yet. Okay. Other questions? Okay, if not, we'll move on to 